a carpenter. He's knocked on plenty of wood. Adam Corolla! Got to get on a choice. We got on Mandy. Get on. Thank you guys for uh, coming out tonight. Dickie Barrett from the Boston's going to join us uh, very soon. I uh, have a couple of thoughts, uh, local thoughts. I'd like to start the show with some local thoughts. I know the uh, Avalanche is uh, playing tonight. <laughs> Fuck you guys. You're not fans. <laughs> You'd be at the arena or in front of your TV set yelling at your kid to get the fuck out of the room if you're real fans. Let's not confuse you with real fans. As I speak, they're on the ice trying to clinch the Stanley Cup, and you assholes are here. So don't try to sell me that bullshit. Uh, Number one. Number two, um, we've uh, taken to calling the avalanche the Avs, And my feeling is um, we don't need to shorten everything. (laughs) Avalanche is not really a mouthful. It's the name of the team. It's what they're called. Um, I'm a big Rams fan. I don't call them the Ruh. (laughs) Then I run out of steam for the last two letters. They're not the Avs. They're the Avalanche. Frozen yogurt is not Froyo. Frozen yogurt, we got all the time in the world. We can say frozen and yogurt. No one is in a hurry when they're getting frozen yogurt. So let's just go avalanche and not avs. I was, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed this in your own airport, but when I landed yesterday, I was walking through the airport and I was passing the uh, men's room and I decided to head in and it said it was a tornado zone. I I actually wrote down what it was called. It was called a tornado shelter. Do you guys know that? So if you're at the, if you're at the uh, Denver airport, oh, I sent over a picture, Chris. If you're at the uh, Denver airport and there's a tornado, we need you to hide in the bathroom. I started thinking about that. Like, is that really the way you want to go out? on your hands and knees on the cold porcelain of the bathroom. My feeling is uh, tornado's an act of God, and uh, that's a force majeure, and I don't want to be cowering in a bathroom. (laughs) First off, every dude runs to the bathroom, and you just hide in the bathroom when a tornado is coming. That's like saying... (laughs) Oh, we're going to turn this uh, Cuisinart into a spittoon. <laughs> it just seems like a bad idea. Plus, there could be confusion. You know, you could go hide in one of the stalls and your foot could slip and touch another guy's foot and he could get the wrong idea. <laughs> the next thing you know, there's a sexual rendezvous going on. I want you to know if there's a... Uh, Tornado that hits when I'm at the Denver airport. I'm just going to take my shirt off and just stand right by the baggage carousel and yell, bring it with my left hand. <laughs> Up in the air. There's a, uh, a band. I, I wanted to get out to uh, Red Rocks because uh, Red Rocks is majestic and everyone always says, go to Red Rocks. And I always do go to Red Rocks whenever I come to Colorado. I always go out to Red Rocks, and then I said, uh, well, we want to go out to Red Rocks, but then when you go out to Red Rocks, when they have bands playing, they just kick you out of the place, right? Because, um, okay, first things first, the the show starts at 8. Why do we get the boot at 3.30? Because some fucking Hesher wants to hang around, drop ass, and throw around a fucking hacky sack. Let them do it. I'm doing their mom's apartment. The band that's playing at Red Rocks, I wrote this down, is called uh, Widespread Panic. And it was was told to me that that's a jam band. So the the last time I was at Red Rocks, we were here about a year ago, we went there and Lettuce was playing, and we're told that's a jam band. And then Widespread Panic 
is also so pretty aggressive name for a jam band. <laughs> then it was explained to me that they're playing Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night because they're a jam band and the same people go all three nights and hang out. And I started thinking, I don't like jam bands. I, I, don't, I don't like fish, I don't like Grateful Dead, I don't like lettuce, I don't like widespread panic. <laughs> Don't go up on stage and make shit up as you go. You got a microphone, man. That audience paid good money. You prepare, you rehearse, and you talk about stuff, man. You don't just waltz out on stage half cocked and do things with your uh, stuff. Shit, I should have worked this out. <laughs> I'm as bad as widespread panic. <clears throat> so uh, they don't let you go up there and, and uh, hang out. It was also explained to me, they, someone was telling me they have stuff going there all the time. They got movies going there. They got a lot of bands going there. Does anyone ever tell you shit where the, you get about halfway in? They're describing you what it is, and you're like, I'm fucking out. Like, they're like, <laughs> they, also go, they also do a sunrise yoga. Okay, let's just get that shit. No, you're fucking nuts. <laughs> you think I'm going to fall asleep there and wake up sober the next day? No, no. You go there at four in the morning and do yoga. It's like, oh, get that shit the fuck out of here. There's no goddamn way I would ever participate in a sunrise yoga class over there I wrote other things down on my list here oh um, talk to Dickie about some stuff when he comes out I uh, I don't know if you guys are like me but um, so I was in a, I did a corporate gig in Westminster last last night right so um, Westminster, wherever, not a lot of love for Westminster, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had an uncle who molested me, lived out in Westminster. So fuck, fuck Stuart. Not putting my hands together for that old fuck. <laughs> All right, fine. You don't like Westminster. It seemed nice to me. We, so I, uh, we landed in Denver yesterday. I took uh, shelter in the bathroom for about 20 minutes. And then once, once the coast was clear, we got out, we got in the car, went to Westminster, and then uh, did like a gig last night in Westminster. And then met uh, Dickie Barrett, who'll be on stage in a couple of few, and uh, Mike and my son. We all went out to uh, Denver and we went to a steakhouse, which uh, stayed open for us. We hung out, we had some drinks and had some uh, eats. And that wrapped up about yeah, 11 30, 12 at night. Got back to the hotel, went to bed about 12 30, 1 o'clock. And I was due at 6.30 this morning to jump in the car of uh, one of the uh, promoters here at the club. And they were going to take me out. We're going to go all the way back to wherever we are now, south, right? We're going to go out here. We're going to do some radio stations. So I went to bed about 12.45 last night, uh, woke up about 6 a.m. this morning and uh, got up, felt like shit, uh, got my shit together, was heading out to meet the lady to drive me for 45 minutes across town to come do some radio this morning, and uh, got into the elevator on the 12th floor about uh, 6.25 this morning after sleeping for about five hours and 10 minutes, and I don't know if you guys are like me, when I'm tired and I'm hungover and I'm miserable, I want to run into other tired, hungover, miserable people, not chipper fucks, you know what I mean? Like the people that just came back from swimming laps, like, oh man, I got up at four and I was bored. I didn't know what to do, so I started swimming laps, you know? I got a, they're having a international softball tournament in Westminster and I got onto the elevator and a, a couple joined me. It was a 14 year old girl and her dad and she was dressed head to toe in softball regalia and he was a dad and his 
T-shirt said they were from Canada. It said Can- Canada Dad, Canada Dad, or whatever the fuck it said. All I knew is it angered me. At six, <laughs> fuck is that T-shirt? <laughs> You know when you're fucking hungover, everything makes you mad? They're like, what position do you play? Shortstop? That's bullshit, man. <laughs> Fuck that. Fucking turning two. <laughs> so they'd been up since 4.15 in the morning, probably went to bed at 8 o'clock that night and couldn't wait to, wait to play. But um, I got in the car and I started doing uh, morning radio. And... Uh, I wrote something out here. Boulder people. Mm. <laughs> oh, this is an esoteric thought, but um, I went down to Boulder today and uh, went down to the, I don't know, the, whatever the promenade is there in Boulder. What's that called? Pearl Street. Pearl Street. There's a lot of people just sort of uh, working on the street, you know, playing the guitar. Some lady was giving massages. Other guy <laughs> that seemed overtly sexual for the street. <laughs> there was a good massage person. There was magic guy. And uh, I just thought, you know, it's, 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 I, I just stopped and looked at all these people out sort of hustling on the street. They weren't homeless or anything. They, they had jobs. Their job was go down and try to extract money from the public and see how they did. But I also had this weird thought, which is like, everyone else has a job where you can kind of know how much you make when you leave the house. You know, you could be a school teacher or you could be a, a captain of industry, but either way, it's kind of worked out that you're going to make X amount. It's just got to be a weird job where you leave your house and you have no fucking idea if you'll come home with a nickel or $500 that day. And every one of these guys down in Boulder giving massages, playing the acoustic guitar, doing magic, those guys leave the house, have no goddamn idea whether they'll make a penny or not. Like, well, what are we, what are we eating for dinner tonight? Could be surf and turf, could be top ramen. I have no good idea. All right, so Dickie, who went to the wrong, Dickie went to the wrong club tonight, so says, <laughs> so says Mike. He actually went out to the one in Denver, downtown, because uh, Dickie is staying in downtown. And then he went to that club, and then he texted Mike and said uh, he went to the wrong club. Now he's turning around and coming out here. But I don't know if Dickie has arrived or not. So he's, Chris, he's not arrived. Yet. He's he has not arrived. Three, so all right, away. I'll tell you. Uh, I'll tell you what a good guy uh, Dickie is. So uh, Dickie, lead singer of the Boston's. You guys know that band, right? <laughs> Dickie is just a good dude. He's just a knock around. Dude, he, I met Dickie in 1995. I was uh, nobody working for K-Rock Radio in Los Angeles. And here comes Dickie, K-R-O-Q. And Dickie and the Boston's were a big deal and they're playing this big summer concert called the, the Weenie Roast. And I was the peon from the radio station kind of wandering around backstage at the Irvine Meadows and uh, at some point it passed by a tour bus and Dickie was hanging out and Dickie just kind of pointed at me and said uh, hey come on out and uh, have a beer good to see you my friend pick up that microphone hello everybody I got about 20 minutes prepared on on Mike August <laughs> okay let's hear it all um, first of all I texted him and said, is this the venue? Didn't hear from him. This sure. was like an hour ago. Right. I get to the other, I go, through avalanche traffic. <laughs> Stanley, oh. downtown Stanley Cup. Yeah. <laughs> we, finals, congratulations. We call them the Avs out here. I go, go to ahead. the other venue. <laughs> Local Avs, but go ahead. There's, <laughs> there's another comedy works. Yes. 
And it's almost in the same building as the Stanley Cup. <laughs> so I get there and the guy is really, I don't want to say smug, but I think it's happened to him before that someone, an asshole like me, shows up and mm -hmm. goes, oh, I'm definitely on the guest list, on Adam's guest list. Yeah, that's across town. Mm. And then he starts to give me the directions, and then I, and then I said, fucking August. <laughs> and uh, I headed out back into the parking garage, in, and, and in the parking garage, then I couldn't find my ticket, of course. Sure. And I go, all right, I'll just eat this. And it said $50, and I backed it up and said, I ain't eating this. <laughs> <laughs> and then again, I said, fucking August. Yeah, I know. I, it's very convenient. You lose your parking tickets. Like, you lose it, you pay the maximum. It's like, I thought like $20. Why? why? Why not pay the medium? You know what I mean? Like, all right, word zero, the maximum is this. Why do we go all the way? It's like, you, you lose it, you pay, you pay the maximum. I backed up. I went through everything. And, I, and, and unfortunately, I carry one of these. My kids gave it to me. Yeah, it's a man purse. All right, we all have kids, and right. we're not all wearing these, but I... I hey, yeah. hey, Dickie, can I, I, can I just on. say this? Can I say this yeah. real quick? Because Dickie's got a man purse. A lot of guys I talk to, they're wearing fucking re retarded bracelets, and I'm like, why are you wearing that? My kid gave it to me. Hey, what if your kid gave you a cock ring? <laughs> Even if it was bejeweled. Like, all right, my kids give me shit. They go in an ashtray in my den. They don't go on me outside. I wore it. I left because I was going. At the, they gave it to me like three Christmases ago. Right. And I was heading to Boston Christmas night. So uh -huh. leaving, I wore it. Right. Through the airport, I wore it. Through Boston for like a day, I wore it. By the third day, I'm like, this thing's awesome. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Right up till tonight when I couldn't find that parking ticket. Yeah. And then, dude, like a miracle. I swear this happens. I'm not making it up. So I back up, and I'm out. I'm out of the car now, and I've got everything out of this bag and everything out of my pocket. I go, that's it. I'm going to have to pay that $50. I look up. The gate was up. Oh. Just for no reason at all. It was like just Moses. up. Right. I jump. Woo. I did 85 miles an hour through that gate. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly hit about seven bird scooters. You That's know, still going on here, the bird scooter thing. Oh, I know. You guys are maniacs out there. I would buy a car, like if somebody said to me, look, I got a sports car, it's 250K, bad on mileage, bad on performance, bad on maintenance but it will make it under a parking gate. <laughs> I'd be like, I'll make that 250K back in nine months. The Ford Limbo. I would dun, literally... Dun, 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 if you dun, buy... Dun. Yeah, the Limbo. I, I, if, has anyone dr driven a low-slung car? Like, I had a, uh, a one of the newer Datsun 350Zs, like, you know, it was like 10 years ago or something. That thing is raked, and it is fucking low, and it will slide under. Now, you will make contact, <laughs> but it'll it's contour contact. Like, you'll slide under, and it'll just push that piece of one by six uh, knotty pine up, and you will slide right under that right under that bad boy you rely a little bit on the give oh yeah oh there's flop <laughs> there's flop in that it's also a kind of a, it's a weird psychological thing because now they have the mechanized bifolding arm but for 10,000 years it was a piece of one by six knotty pine that they trimmed down to three inches and they graduated up to five and a half inches. And it was on a small flimsy bracket that was nine feet away. Any human being could have driven, you could have taken a moped in reverse and went right through that and not even fucking felt it. But we would stop and go, God, 186 bucks, fuck. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a second mortgage on the house. <laughs> or I'm just going to have to leave the car here and go to Mexico and start a new life. Like any one of us could have just slid right under that piece of knotty pine. But we never made the move. But you can do it. So, so you found, Dickie, you found your ticket. 
No, I just told you the gate oh, was the gate open. Sorry, I miraculously. You found it. No, you're right. You were talking about your yeah. bag, the the miraculous bag. No, no, no. I moved on from that. The kids gave me the bag. It turned out. Hey, I, can I'm I not say, pandering here, but can I say this? It's a good looking crowd. It's a good looking crowd. Right? Can I uh, looking around? Can I say this about the man purse, Dicky? Go ahead, dude. Okay. Just, I'm not taking it off. For, uh, no, I'm saying, but this is my. <laughs> This is my thing. The man purse should have a breakaway strap. And the reason I'm saying that, once it gets more than like eight pounds of pressure, it just snaps like a <laughs> lizard's tail. You know, because when you go back to Boston and it's, you're wearing a man purse and a couple of townies grab hold of the strap and yeah. start trying to ram their <laughs> knee in your, in your orbital socket, it just breaks loose and you can run to freedom. They can try it, dude, but a townie's not going to take me out. Look at, all right, let me just model this a little bit. It's not that bad. It's not like, right? It's like, it could almost be a camera or a, something like that. Wallet, phone, and about um, $75 in change. Okay. All right. That's so that I just, for every cup of coffee I buy, I go, I give them a, the barista a dollar and then just the handful of change in there. Do like you, it does get too heavy and I'm limping. Do you remember the first time we met? Do I ever? It was so romantic. <laughs> you know. I'll never forget. Where yeah, were we? Um, the first time we met was uh, the K-Rock, right? K-Rock. Weenie Roast, right? Weenie Roast. You walked up to our trailer. Your bus. I think you had a bus. Oh, yeah, had a we had a bus. bus. Yeah. No, no, because we had a trailer because we were one of the... Oh, okay. You had a trailer. Yeah. Right, right. We wouldn't let you on the bus. That's right. Um, yeah, and and just introduce K Rock is a different animal. Most cities, um, big radio station, you go there and um, the audience is constantly like scream like um, you they, they, you suck. We hate this radio, so we hate that. But in L A, they love K Rock. Like it was Ooh. something you're not used to, and right. they loved Adam. And, and all of the dish jockeys, Jimmy, they love there, and, and, and uh, Kevin and Bean, and those people. Like, I was, like, ready to go on stage there and go, uh, FK Rock Evans. Uh -huh. Like, no way. You don't do yeah. that there. And, um, yeah, we loved that. And they put on good, big concerts back in the 90s when uh, people knew who I was. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> well, now they know his purse, dude. <laughs> I, sw I was big. I was back then for about five minutes in 1997. I was, uh, well, speaking of 1997, I don't know if you got it, Chris, but uh, me and Sonny were watching uh, the Boston's on, uh, on Conan from 1997 yeah and we were enjoying and and, and dicky knows this and but now my son has uh understood it, it's kind of funny when your son who's uh 16 now my son sort of they start to come online and you realize you know they they think like you and i always marveled at the fact that the boston's just traveled with a dancer you just had yes. a dedicated dancer and i was explaining to that to sonny i was like no he's in the band he gets his pay he gets the same pay as the other guys in the band and sonny's like and he just dances and i'm like yeah he just he just dances. there he is there he is and and there's dicky leading the leading the nervous and what am i nervous? doing here don't look at me we've got a dancer <laughs> <laughs> and if the dancer's not enough, there's a horn section. We got horns, we got... Ignore the quality of my voice. We've got a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> it saved a lot of my legs, and, and I'm a terrible dancer. Right, and Sonny was just enthralled with your full-time dancer. This wasn't for Conan. On TV. He no. bought a house doing that. He bought a house dancing. Dancing. Yes. <laughs> Most of the time when you think of like dancers, you think of like Madonna's dancers or right. something. Or, yeah. You know? That had to be There's funny. the working class guy. <laughs> He's just dancing every show, every event, every place. He's just in a suit 
dancing. You can't not look cool if that's going on next to you, though, right? I get it. It's like if the dude's doing that, then anything I do is okay. Right. But Thinking. It's all, it's and also, the suits, too. The suits. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, look. Uh, turn it up. We knew line. that at some point oh. we were going to be out of shape. Put a suit on. Oh, God. I'm not a coward, I've just never been tested. I love that line. Right? Yep. How apropos. I love that The impression line. that I get. I love that song. I love all the... I've always loved the Boss Tones. And, and I've always loved you, Adam. And the Boss Tones have always loved you. So, but it's interesting that that guy bought a house dancing. And it must have been confusing for his neighbors. Because he was like, how did you afford this pricey house in this upscale neighborhood outside of Boston? He's like, I'm a dancer. You're kind of a doughy white guy. Yeah, I know. Well, let's see some of your moves. <laughs> what? No, you're not. You're not. A, oh yeah, a professional dancer. Now, did he get? Because, like I said, Sonny's obsessed with the dancer. He he got the same cut as everyone in the band. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> she yelled, "What? <laughs> <laughs> what?" <laughs> So the guy played. Let me explain it to you. We never thought we were going to make a cent. We were, we were, you know, half a dozen. We were like eight guys from Boston that were trying to avoid... Thank you very much. Boston in the back where they belong. <laughs> <laughs> Safely in the back of the room. <laughs> Anything starts, it's back there. <laughs> So we didn't expect to make a cent or do anything. Or we just knew that we didn't want to work regular jobs and that there was, if we got up on stage in, in these clubs in Boston at the time, they would give us free beer and we could hang out together. We were, we were all best friends. We loved each other. And then, you know, we decided, okay, let's start a band. And then who's going to sing? And I grabbed the mic first. <laughs> And then the bass player and the guitar player fought it out for guitar. And then there was a drummer. And, and then we, we just ended up doing that. And then we, all right, so we show up to our first show. And, and we were, some of the guys were underage. I was like 20 at the time. And, and uh, they go, everybody has to be uh, 21 years or older or on that stage. So we all got on the stage. <laughs> And then he was just oh, going to so be our roadie. Oh, so you couldn't hang out in the green room. No, there were too many be, young kids with you us. You couldn't hang out and be underage, but if you're on stage. On stage, and then he goes, well, what do I do? And I go, just start dancing. <laughs> and 45 years later, <laughs> some, and he hasn't missed, he never missed a show. And, and another thing about him too is sometimes I don't, like he's just there, and I don't even kind of, it's just sort of like, He's there, and then I look over, and, oh yeah, he does that. <laughs> and um, he was great at it, and people loved it, and, and I wouldn't have it any, if I had it to do over, I'd do it again. Yeah, yeah. that's a good. <laughs> Big ups to Ben Carr. Ben Carr. From Cambridge, Massachusetts. But that is, that's an interesting. Cambridge in the way back. <laughs> This is interesting that there's a whole bunch of your friends there and they were going to hang out, but they couldn't hang out if, because they were underage. It was funny because the audience stage. turned into the band. Like, they were just going to sit and watch us and no one else showed up. And then when, they, and when the owner of the club said that, then they all just got on stage. Like, all right. Did you guys do cover stuff at the very beginning or were you doing originals? No, that would have been, that would have taken some time. <laughs> you were <laughs> doing hanged out. I actually really, I think the first show, I really didn't even know what the horn section was doing. Mm -hmm. And then during it, I heard it, I go, oh, that's pretty good. Right. You know, like cause in the practice space, we didn't have a PA or proper equipment, you know, but we knew we wanted horns for some reason, but we didn't have the we didn't think it out and go well what are they going to play and, and then 
What was your first MTV hit? Um, well, there was some success with Where'd You Go, a song called Where'd You Go. I remember that one. And um, all college stuff. There was college radio at that time, too, so we were charting like on the, on the CMJ and college music. And, um, but the first time at that time, because things are so different now, of course, if you heard your song on the radio, you just lost it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. You couldn't believe it. There I am, I'm on the radio. And I remember, and it was just college radio, Emerson College Radio. And they played us and I was thrilled. It was just, I'm calling people. What was your second hit? Second, maybe um, Someday I Suppose. That is, uh, that's always been my, my favorite yeah. Boston song. You guys know that song? Chris will, Chris isn't will find it. Your it. Open, isn't it your opening theme song? No. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. No, no. Uh, isn't our opening theme song I, I Rascal King? I can't remember. King? He can't remember. No, your closing's Rascal King. Oh, the, yeah, Rascal, Rascal that's King That's the one you hear on your way out the door. Oh. Rascal King is, uh, let me see here. Yep. And that, that was, was in, um. That was in The Hammer. That was in The yeah, Hammer, too, love, yeah. Yeah, the, but uh, someday I suppose. Is that our opening song? Yeah. Oh, how come I never hear it? Dun, dun, <laughs> dun, dun. Oh, there it is, yeah. And yeah, Dawson. I hear a little bit of that. All right. Yeah, you know what we never I don't have any without going. Dawson talking over it. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me, let me that is, uh, I'd like to hear Dawson. <laughs> Here, I'll hear Sears it with Dawson then. Live from Comedy Works South in Denver, Colorado. God this damn it, Dawson, is... shut up. I want to hear the rest of the song. <laughs> All right, you remember the second time I, I saw you, or who the hell knows? Were we in uh, D.C.? We were in uh, Washington, D.C. at the uh, WHF Festival. So WHFS was a huge rock station, or alternative rock station, yeah. in, uh, in D.C. They put on a summer concert at RFK Stadium, so wherever the then Redskins played. And it was a big, big venue and a big, big show. You guys were playing, I don't know, I'm trying to think of all the other bands from that. like Stone Temple Pilots. Stone Temple and, uh, Pilots, yeah. Yeah, all yeah those, they were there. No Doubt, like all those. Green all, Day was Green there. Day, all those, all those 90s bands. And, um, oh, I, the 90s. Oh, the 90s. I, <laughs> I, you guys tell me what, what you would do in my position. They, we were, uh, Love Line was a huge show, a syndicated show. Love Line was a big syndicated show on WHFS in DC. And so their whole thing is we're going to fly out Adam Carolla and he's going to do a stage announcement and he's going to bring a band out because they would have all these notable people come out and you'd go like, how's it going DC? And everyone start cheering and then you'd bring out System of a Down or something, although that was 90s. It was probably even before. They had Stone Temple Pilots or some band like that. They flew me on a uh, private jet. We had the corporate private wow. jet from LA to DC. It must have been a $50,000 <laughs> flight. I flew it uh, out there with um, the program director and the general manager from K-Rock in Los Angeles. And I remember sitting on that flight and uh, the general manager of K-Rock at some point leaned over and he said to me, hey, can you, uh, can you stop calling, um, can you stop calling Mountain Dew Nectar of the Tards? <laughs> And I said, why? I hate Mountain Dew. <laughs> and he said, because we have big contracts with PepsiCo. And I said, well, Pepsi's Pepsi and Mountain Dew is nectar of the tards. And he goes, guess who owns Mountain Dew? <laughs> and he goes, Pepsi, so shut the fuck up, would you already? <laughs> That's all I remember from that flight. <laughs> a six hour flight. I just remember that one exchange. We landed in D.C. on like a, uh, oh God, it was like a Saturday. 
and um, the uh, the show, or maybe it was Friday night. We landed like in the afternoon, and the show was going to be Saturday. And we went went to the hotel, and we're going out that night. There's a famous club in D.C. I think Ben Folds Five was playing there, which I, I love Ben Folds Five. And somehow ran into Andy Dick at the bar, and he forced me to do some shots and tried to fuck my ear. And. At some point, eating soft, we were eating soft shell crab because we were like in Maryland and uh, or somewhere in there, and um, went back to the hotel. Was supposed to take the train to the stadium the following morning or following day at noon and bring the band up. Woke up about 4 a.m. just puking hard, like really, like 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 violent heaving into the toilet of oh, sweat flying everywhere i can't stand i'm gonna sleep on the bathroom floor you know it's always you know you're sick when tile feels good you're like oh fucking tile oh man grout where have you been my whole life god damn do i miss grout <laughs> oh, feels so good to be on this piss soaked tile i can't tell you what relief this is from and I like stagger back in bed and I flop down for 15 minutes. I get up, I boot again. I'm sweating, I stagger back in bed again. I boot again. Uh, it's now like 10 in the morning, I throw up again. I'm just an utter fucking mess. I have horrible food poisoning, I think from the soft shell crab, but maybe from Andy Dick and the multiple <laughs> shots. But it's food poisoning because I have yacked because of booze, uh, you know, not not a lot, maybe like 1,200 times. And like, <laughs> once you yak, be, because of, when you yak because of the booze, you feel incrementally better, right? So it's like, first big yak, you feel a lot better. Maybe there's a secondary yak and you feel even better. Maybe a third and then you're ready to drink again. <laughs> This was, I just kept yakking and I felt worse every time. And at some point I'm just laying in bed and it's 11 o'clock and they flew me private from LA just to go out on stage in front of 50,000 people and bring out the Afghan wigs or whatever band I can't think of the name of. Who was on the WH, WH by 1998, 99? We'll, we'll figure it out. So Chris, figure out. So I remember laying in bed in my hotel room and I was like, if I don't throw up for 45 minutes, then I'm getting dressed and I'm getting on that train and I'm going out to the stadium because I literally thought I was, I mean, they, they flew me in a private jet just to make a three minute stage announcement. And I literally just wasn't going. And, uh, I, I, I didn't throw up for like 45 minutes and I just got myself dressed. <laughs> you know when you're getting dressed and you're struggling to put your pants on? You're like, oh shit, man, both legs? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Who invented these pants? <laughs> I got dressed, I'm like, all right. And I went down there, I probably jumped in a cab, went down there, got my laminate, staggered backstage, I was completely totally depleted, like I'd been throwing up since 4 a.m. I wasn't rehydrating, I didn't have any Pedialyte or Gatorade, I wasn't taking care of myself, and I was just like staggering around backstage RFK Stadium, so it was just this big holding area, and they had all these different tents there for all the different acts, you remember that? Yep. And I just like went like, oh, I saw the boss tones, and I was like, I just threw the curtain open. I was like, I need help. And Dickie's like, we'll get you some Gatorade and a tall boy. And I like <laughs> laid me down on the ground, started feeding me Gatorade, massaging my thighs, <laughs> trying to get me back in the game. <laughs> Who was on there, Chris? <clears throat> oh, we have it. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's, that's me up on stage at uh, RFK. Who were the who were the bands? Do you remember? Same shirt. Yeah, we're the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had the band too. Wearing the same shirt. <laughs> hey, still fits, fucker. 
All right. Okay. Who are the bands, Chris? Cracker. Cracker. Dishwalla. Dishwalla. Yes. Everclear. Art. Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. <laughs> Fred Schneider. <laughs> Garbage. Yeah. Garbage. Garbage. Gin Blossoms. Gin Blossoms. Goldfinger. Yeah. Jewel. Jimmy's Chicken Shack. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Uh, the Afghan Whigs. The Presidents of the United States of America. That's right. Yeah. And the Boston's, I guess. I'm not seeing the Boston's on this one. Oh, well then, yeah. what are we doing? must have been the year before. Or I just hallucinated that entire yeah. Yeah. story. <laughs> Do you remember that? We were we? calling ourselves Jimmy's Chicken Shack. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, can you play it, time. Chris? Is it just a still? That's a video. I've been yakking all night. Drew can't be here, but he's in his hotel room with about 15 Filipino hookers. Oh, God damn. Do you remember going out in front of all stadiums? Right, thank you, all guys. Right. Oh, wait, who am I bringing out? Oh, we'll figure it out. Listen to Love Line, but we got a band to bring up. These guys were on the show about six months ago. They're funny. They're cool. They're the presidents of the United States of America. Oh, they probably sung Lump. I remember telling Jimmy in like 1997, those guys aren't going anywhere. And he's like, yes, they are. <laughs> They're going to be the next Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And I'm like, they got two songs. One's about a lump, and the other's about peaches. And the name. Do you remember where we went out that, that night? Yes. We went into, uh, we went back so into the show. DC. So what, what happened was, and, and I don't know, so that was 97? Oh, that was 96. So this must have been 97 when I saw Dickie there. It is, uh, it is crazy if you ever, anyone, show of hands, anyone made an announcement in front of 50,000 people? <laughs> what happens is, is like everyone goes out there and they do the same spiel and you make fun of them and then you go, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to bring my own cerebral uh, brand of comedy to this crowd and then you go out there and 50,000 people start cheering and you go I hear DC likes to rock and they go, and they go fuck yeah USA and they all start chanting like all of a sudden you've become that person you hate so much you can't help it. It turns 50,000 people turns everyone with a microphone into a colossal douchebag, like immediately. <laughs> Nothing's interesting. There's no nuance to anything you're saying. It's just a, you just fucking start screaming. So Dickie and the Boss Zones must have been the year after or the year before. But so once Dickie rehydrated me, yeah. I felt better. I went out. I brought out whatever band I brought out that year, then Boss Tones went out there and crushed it. After the show, Dickie and I were like, well, let's go out. And Dickie said, we should go to the gay part of town and have steaks. <laughs> Do you remember that, Dickie? No, it was our friend Steve from, from the, the Pie from the Tasters. DC, yeah, the DC man, the Pie Tasters. And we said we wanted to go out and eat steaks. He goes, got just the place for it. <laughs> I, went, I didn't go, let's go cruise the gay section of town and see if like, we can come up with any meat. Tiki was like, uh, you want to borrow a brown bandana? <laughs> Make sure it's in your life pocket. Don't I know what we should do. So Steve took us there because he's lived his whole life in D.C. All right. And we went out. It was just the fucking best. It was the best night of my life because... That morning, I woke up. I mean, at, at 10 a.m. that morning, I was yakking and feeling I was on death's doorstep. And that night, I was sitting with Dickie at a gay steakhouse in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> fucking ordering sides. It was, it was awesome. So it was 98 then, Chris, was the, uh, was the boss. Yeah, actually, I have them from 97 to 99. 
Oh, really? So, yeah. So, so the boss don't sit at three years. Yeah. Then. Oh, God damn. All right. So, Chris, our, our Internet connection is shitty with Brian and Gina. That, that's what I'm hearing. I mean, I, you want to give it a shot? It's always just a... <laughs> uh, what do we got? We got the Rotten Tomatoes game. Rotten Tomatoes we game. We got the news to do. Unprepared. And we got unprepared to do. Let's see. Well, let's try. Let's right, see. Let's see how the uh, internet connection is and see if that works. Gina, bald. Hey there. Oh, it's it's good. Let's see. Uh, Gina, sing the dreidel song. I had a little dreidel, I made it out of clay. And when it's dry and ready, oh, dreidel, I shall play. Oh, dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. Anything? All right, yeah, the audio's pretty, uh, pretty much there. So we'll, Brian's we'll, dancing was damn good. All right. We'll give it a... Should be a dancer. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll give it a shot. All right, you guys want to roll right into Adam. the... Uh, yes, Brian. Uh, explain to the audience what a dreidel is. <laughs> It's a, it's a top for Jews. <laughs> you spin it. Yeah. And it lands yeah. on something, and that's, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, nobody would play that game ever again. I mean, I don't even think you could convince a Jewish kid to play that game. Looks like Gina has one. Did you just pull one up? Do you have yeah. a dreidel? I, 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 not, not on me, but I could spin this coaster if you want. Oh, okay. That's a, yarm- that's a yarmulke. <laughs> <laughs> Too much starch in the yarmulke makes a coaster. All right. So the Rotten Tomatoes game, Dickie. Well aware of it. Well aware of the Rotten Tomatoes game. Noah Well, avid listener. Yes. All right. So you got a Every pen. episode. I love that about you. You got a pen, and we can roll right into the Rotten Tomatoes game with Dawson. So in honor of our Denver audience, we'd like to take a look at some of the cinematic treasure that were either set or partially filmed in the iconic city of Denver, Colorado. Right. Beginning his journey in Denver, a former race car driver turned car delivery driver places a bet with his drug dealer that he can get a 1970 Dodge Challenger RT 440 Magnum to San Francisco in under 15 hours. This quickly turns into a publicized police chase starring Barry Newman, Cleavon Little, and Dean Jagger from 1971, Vanishing Point. Never heard of it. This was a 70s movie. In the 70s, all you really needed was a cool piece of American muscle. The guy do a burnout. At some point, they jump something. It wasn't much. There was always a bridge that was out. I don't know. Like in movies, if the bridge was out, it was 100 100% 100% we're going for it. I feel in real life, I've never been in a car with someone who went, well, the bridge is out. We're going for it. <laughs> First off, whoever's riding passenger in that car does not ever protest enough. Like, <laughs> Dickie, if we were driving and you announced the bridge is out, we're going for it, I wouldn't just put my hands on the dash and lean back. I'd be like, what the fuck? Are you nuts? Ah, I'm getting out of this fucking rental. <laughs> We're going to crash mini, the gate here. This is a minivan. All right, so they just had a cool car, and people kind of liked this movie because it was 70s, and the thing had a V8 in it, and no one knew. Everyone was so high on Coke. They never knew what was going on. 
I never even saw this movie. It's a car movie, and I haven't even what? seen it. I'm a car wow. guy. That, yeah. that, that affects, sure? that affects yeah. the Maybe score. That doesn't bode well. I've heard, I've heard about it, but it's it's like it's like it's back in the day when essentially movies like you guys aren't old enough some of you are but there was a movie theater and that was a theater that was in your town dickie what yeah. was your local movie theater the norwood cinema the norwood yeah. cinema so i had two i had the guild and the el portal and if I would have, when I, no, that's your local theater. There wasn't the big Cineplex. You couldn't stream anything that, no. on demand. That was it. Whatever movie landed there, the fucking movie was there for 19 weeks. You could see it or not, but at some point you want to get some air conditioning and a milk dud in you, and you would go. And if you're walking down the street and the marquee read, Adam's grandma being cornholed <laughs> in living color. At some point, like week seven, I would have went, oh, fuck it, we're going. What the fuck else do we have to do? There's nothing else to do. We have to go. So when they would make these piece of shit 70s movies, no budget, no script, no stars, no nothing, and they would just land in your town, and it was like, I dare you not to fucking watch me. you super bored. And we were latchkey. We, there was nothing. I was not like, oh, fuck that. I'm going to sit in front of my big screen and play Angry Birds. There wasn't any of that. I'm going to watch you porn. No. A vanishing point's playing. Who gives a shit? We're in. We didn't even know. We would go see movies. We didn't know what they were. It was just like, it's there. It's in your town. It's there for two months. You must go at some point. And that's how these movies, that's how we've even heard of them. All right. You locked in? You asking me? Yep. Yes. All right. I'm locked in. It, it, I think the critics thought it was semi-interesting at 41. The only thing I know about Vanishing Point, the only thing is quoted in a Guns N' Roses song, so I'm going to say 53. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I've never heard of this. I'm playing it semi-safe. I said 55. I played it like an asshole and said 65. All right. That's not bad. Well, that's my first time. Well. Thank you, Gina. It turns out good for the asshole. Vanishing point is fresh at 79%. Oh, oh my God. Oh, thank you. Wow, the people haven't anyone. It's a cult classic. It's a piece of shit. I guarantee you would kill yourself if you watch this movie. Ugh. Well, if Denver is known for one thing, hold on, Dickie, it's probably not hold on, dressing. Justin. Hold on, does it? What were some of the shitty movies you would go to in the seventies at that um, local cinema? The I, Last House on the Left. You ever see that? Last House on the Left is like a horror movie. But like n no other horror movie. It was insanely. It was really inappropriate. I was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like eight years old. <laughs> people were being butchered. Um, but I can remember seeing the movies I remember seeing. They they didn't all suck. Like like um, Monty Python's Holy Grail. Oh, that was there. Yeah. Yeah, I saw Rocky. I saw the original Rocky yeah. at one of those. I saw Pepion, the uh, oh, yeah? Steve that McQueen too, uh, yeah. movie. But then there was just also pieces of shit like Doc Savage <laughs> and stuff and weird shit in between. Sorry, Dawson. Go ahead. If Denver is known for one thing, it's probably not cross-dressing scandals in youth soccer leagues. Desperate for a promotion at work, a man who is far more likely to kick a hangover than a soccer ball becomes coach of the all-girls soccer team the company sponsors. He enlists his fiancé's son to pose as a ringer complete with a full makeover to ensure the team wins the championship so he will finally get some respect. Starring Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah. Jackie, Harry, and Jonathan Brandis from 1992. Ladybugs. Classic. Didn't they get the memo? You can't do that anymore. Wait a minute. Jack, Jack K was in this, right? That was Jack K. Uh, Jack A, yes. Oh. Jack K. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mary. Huh, Gina, what would you sound like if you were a sassy black woman? Oh, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> that was her line on, that was her only line on 227 that I remember. Yes, Jack K. All right, she was. Uh, all right, so this is a pile of crap movie, but uh, well, Rodney Dangerfield, coach, not first class. Uh huh. 
<laughs> Good tagline. Right? Good tagline. All right. How bad is this? What do they think of this? I don't want to blow my lead. Yeah. Dickie's off to a, a great start, but now you you got to protect it. Do you have kids' movies? They give them a few points, right? Yeah. All right. Say they didn't like this one. All right. Is everyone locked in? It's Rodney, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Rodden at 23. Rodden at wild. 23. Boy. I went bold and I said zero. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. He's making me look downright generous. I said 14. Dickie? Worked for me last time. I'm going with 65. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Look at Gina's face. Yes, good. <laughs> Ladybugs is rotten at 12%. Oh. oh. I needed that. All right, here we go into the championship rounds. After accidentally giving all of his personal information to a con artist, one man has just one week to bring the culprit to justice before his life is ruined forever. And just like in the plot of this movie, Atlanta, Georgia tries to deceive the audience into thinking they are actually Denver, Colorado. Starring Jason Bateman, Melissa McCarthy, and John Favreau from 2013, oh, Identity Denver. Thief. Oh. Huh. I have, I, I, I sort of remember this one. Brian, you have thoughts? I think it's pretty bad. But people like Bateman is really good, and she's good, and... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bella yeah. McCarthy, yeah. Who yeah. can her movies? All right. I think they hated this one. I'm locked in. Is everyone else locked in? Yeah. Yep. 39. 30. 26. 35. Identity Thief is also rotten at 19. Ooh. Oh, God. Denver came, Denver came to play. <laughs> they made some now, bad Although movies. mostly shot. Go ahead. What'd you say, Dickie? So they made some bad movies in Denver. Yeah, I know. You guys inspired a lot yeah. of bad. Yeah. <laughs> Although mostly shot in Nebraska, <laughs> at least one scene of this movie was filmed in Denver. As we can see Jack Nicholson drive past the Ogden Theater. After retiring from his job at an insurance agency and the sudden death of his wife, a man travels in a Winnebago to stop his daughter from marrying a waterbed salesman. Starring Jack Nicholson, Bay Hope Davis from 2002, about Schmidt. Really good news scene in this. Mm -hmm. with, with Kathy Bates? Kathy Bates. Oh, that's right. Bates in a, in a hot tub. All right. Anyone hot have tub, any right? thoughts about this film? I don't know much about Never it. Saw. I heard it was okay. And, well, does anyone ever say, oh my God, you haven't seen About Schmidt? <laughs> no, never once. No, in only twice today, and it's late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but it's Jack. How bad can it be? Hold on. Has anybody played in this room, played the Ogden Theater? Oh, Dickie has. Thank you. More than one occasion. Great venue. Well, yeah, where is that? Just downtown? There's two of them. There's one downtown. <laughs> Don't park there. For no reason at all, there's two of them. <laughs> Just so we can send assholes to one of them across town. All right. I'm calling fresh at 63. Yeah, I think this is a good movie. Uh, it might have been even offered like best screenplay or something. So I said 81. Damn! Mm. Oh. I said 68. I said 65 again. <laughs> mm. About Schmidt is certified oh, fresh shit. at 86. Oh. oh! What a damn. The people have it at 74. Damn it, Brian. That, he pulled the head big time there. Here's our final movie. Before it was Ball Arena, 
The Pepsi Center provided a major filming location for this buddy comedy, where two rival figure skaters join forces to compete in pair skating in the World Winter Sport Games. Starring Will Ferrell, John Heater, and Amy Poehler from 2007, Blades of Glory. Denver, y'all laid some yeah. stinkers. That was funny. Isn't it scary that that movie's 15 years old and that's a new movie in my head? Yeah. All right, that movie was funny. They're, they're not always as gracious to comedies as they should be, but there's a lot of laughs in that movie, right? All right, Brian's got a nice lead. One of us is going to have to land it dead nuts on to get our five-point deduction. And... I'm going in at 77. Oh, boy. I went lower. I, I, there's some really funny laughs in this movie, but I can't imagine it was well-reviewed. 61. Okay, I'm unnecessarily cruel. I never saw it, and I said 44. No, it's a little better than that. Dickie. I said 65. 65. <laughs> Blades of Glory is fresh yes at 70 percent wow i'm out all right whoa what does that mean where are we at is i think ball? brian i think brian has this one but uh we'll tabulate and tell you now who does right. this math dawson 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 does the math gina grad Gina Grad, congratulations, you made the podium right. Hold on, can I tell you how Dawson does his math? <laughs> it's like, if you had a six pack and some guy traded you one of your natty lights for a joint, how many would you have left in the cooler? So he kind of works it out with the kind of beer and pot <laughs> math. So, sorry, go ahead, Dawson. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Dickie Barrett, your strategy of going 65 every single time landed you in last place <laughs> with 109. I won't do that again. Still a respectable, a respectable score. A respectable score, though. It's my first time. Playing. Adam Carolla. Mm. Adam Carolla, you are on the podium with 99. Oh, oh boy. Yuck. That leaves Brian and Gina. Bald Brian. This one's for the people of Denver. <laughs> Your score for the people of Denver I watched me lose. <laughs> is 63. Okay. And finally, Grad. The winner at everything in life except the Rotten Tomatoes game. Second place, 77. Oh. Hey, Paul Bryan takes up. Paul Bryan's been on quite a run. All right, should we do a little news, Gina, Bald, and uh, Dickie, and then we'll get on to the uh, unprepared and ball pulling up there? Let's roll right into the news, Gina Grad. You got it. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gina Grad. Breaking viral. Weird crime protest politics. Give me news with Gina Grad. Stuff they saw on TMZ. Joe Biden. Coming out. Meet news with Gina. Gina Grad. with Gina Grad. Well, everybody thinks that their password is the best password, and then they go ahead and use that password for everything because it's uncrackable, right? Well, according to a new study, hackers have gotten so good at cracking short passwords that they can knock out simple ones in literally seconds. Even an eight-character password with a bunch of numbers, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, symbols, everything, can be solved within eight hours by the average hacker. The uh, researchers pushed things to the limit and found that passwords that are 18 characters in length could take up to 438 trillion years for the average hacker to figure out. So when it comes to your passwords, make them big and long. Wow. Can I say this? Are you guys like me? 
in that you have no confidence in your own passwords. Like every single Correct. time well, I try to like get into my whatever account, you know, Netflix, Amazon, or email, or whatever it is, someone will go, it'll go like, give me your password, and I'll go, okay. And I'll try something, and I'll go, that was wrong, and I'll go, I'm sorry. I never go, fuck you, that's my password. Don't give it, I immediately abandon. And then I guess, and then I guess again, and then at some point it locks you out because you've been trying your own yep. password too many times. It's a scourge, this whole I, I usually get tired thing. trying to identify which of the pictures has a bike in it. Oh, when you're doing that one? Yeah. I don't know. Is that a bridge? I don't know. Four bridges. All right. This one, this oh, one. Oh, that, that makes that sure. That might be. That's an overpass. I don't think that's a, a bridge. Bot. No, wrong. All right. Give me another seven squares. You think the password crackers are the same guys who used to do the Rubik's Cube in 90 <laughs> seconds? Like those guys? <laughs> So how do they do it, Gina? Do you think they just, do they have information? Like, do they know your, you know, they go, you go your pet's name, you go with your mom's maiden name, it's, you do your team? It's, it's generally done by algorithm. So oh, they, okay. can, they can comb everything in your life. And yeah, if you have a lot of pictures of, your, say, oh, I don't know, a dog, a big black lab named Phil, or maybe mm -hmm. it's referenced on the radio or the podcast. Uh -huh. there, maybe they start like, Phil, Phil one. And then they start going from there. Is it, I, I, first off, everyone's gonna get hacked, everyone's gonna have everything jacked, everything's gonna, have every, everything's gonna be broken into. Is it just a better life not to have anything at a yes. certain point? <laughs> just, we should all just walk around like Kane from Kung Fu. Like, shoeless, wearing a gi. And a flute. Flute. <laughs> what do you own, a flute? Anything else? No. Just this pan flute. Just, just rolled I just, up. I got a roll. Pack. Yeah. I got a bed roll. You don't want it. It smells like me. <laughs> what do you do? I just walk barefoot yeah. from town to town. Snatch a rock. Snatch a rock out of my hand, a pebble. <laughs> play the play the flute. I just walk around. Kwai Chang. I go into western towns. What's your drink? Just, I was going to say tap water, but taps haven't been invented yet. <laughs> Take some shit from the locals. Just well water. So what do you do? I just go into bar. I order water. And then what? I just wait around for a local to call me Chinaman. And then I kick the shit out of him in slow motion. And then I go with back my feet. With my feet. And then I just walk to the next town. We should all just be like Kane, right? You know, in, in an interesting way, Kane and, and Vin Diesel from Fast and Furious weren't so far apart. They're, Do tell. Well, Vin Diesel was very family oriented, but just kicked the shit out of everyone for a hundred minutes and then they had a barbecue at the end where he <laughs> talked about how important family was. And Kane never wanted any trouble, but he beat the shit out of everyone in every town he went to. And then he would explain he wants no trouble and then he would walk to the next town. Okay. Did you watch that growing up? I didn't, I, I know more about um, a Kung Fu than um, I do about Vin Diesel. Oh, okay, yeah. good. That's it. That means you're centered. <laughs> <laughs> it means you're righteous and you're living your best life. <laughs> this means I'm old. Because if you talk to someone who knows everything about Vin Diesel and has never heard of Kane from Kung Fu, that person is not centered. No. All right. So uh, maybe we should just get rid of, uh, like John Lennon told us, like all, all our possessions, including our shoes, yeah. and everyone just buy a, a <laughs> recorder, flute, and just walk through the desert because we're all going to get hacked. Here's That's something it. I think that the hackers probably know, is that if you're roughly my age and you're from Boston, you start to hack me by 
anything to do with Larry Bird. Mm-hmm. Larry 3-3. White guy, <laughs> semi-racist, Boston, <laughs> born French in the Lake. 60s. Yeah, I got it. No, that's smart. <laughs> what else you got, Gina? Let's talk about this TikTok challenge, because there's always something. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen this video. I'm, I'm sure you have. This video claiming that if you mix balsamic vinegar with any flavored sparkling water, it tastes like Coca-Cola. Have you oh. heard about this? No, I haven't heard it. Yeah. So people are doing it and they taste it and they're like, that's not half bad. Like it, like someone said, like it tastes like one of those, like, um, like a generic Coke, you know, mm-hmm. something like that. The RC Cola. Exactly. Right. But here's the big problem. Um, the Dental Association, the American Dental Association, is warning that acid... One of those buzzkills, I'm sorry. Well, it turns out that the acid from sugar-free beverages and balsamic vinaigrette is so acidic, it will take the enamel off of your teeth. Mm-hmm. So, dummies, stop eating Tide Pods, stop doing the Angel of Death Challenge, which, by the way, they are doing in parts unknown, I think in Thailand, jumping in front of semi-trucks to see if the trucks stop in time. That's another TikTok challenge. Mm. Stop doing this, or you know what? Maybe we just thin the herd. And sometimes there's more than one challenge going on at once. Like there was a try, there was a uh, tie, I should say, uh, truckers challenge, which is how many of your countrymen can you run over in one night? <laughs> so, <laughs> what you didn't know is that guy had no plans on hitting the brakes because he's in the midst of his own TikTok challenge. <laughs> How many Taiwanese can you run over in one evening? So there's some cross collateralization, they call it in the business world going on there. Uh, look, uh, yeah. how bored and out of problems are we that we just need TikTok challenges? Um, the Tide Pod thing was one that I, I remember from back in the day. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a good sign, at least in this country, that we're looking for things to do to amuse ourselves because we don't have famine or animals or hunger or, or wars to deal with. We're just sitting around thinking of ways to challenge ourselves. But um, I don't, uh, first off, if, let's, let's face it, dentists have a stick up their ass. If they had it their way, we wouldn't eat well, anything four, at four all. Four out of five of them do. That's right. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think they guess what you ate that day anymore, which they used to do when I was a kid. Like they were like, they were like, oh, did someone have an egg salad sandwich? Well, no shit. You have one foot and two hands in my mouth. I think uh, if anyone <laughs> is qualified to guess what I ate 15 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, so don't do it. I'm Let's... a pretty, I, I, these, these days, I'm a pretty diligent flosser and all that stuff, but there was a time in my life where I thought I was very clever and I could fool the dentist on the morning of the appointment. Oh. I just do a power wash and floss. Right. They'll never guess. No, it, it's, it's, it's true, like you treated your teeth like a car that you were gonna turn back in. Like, I'll just fucking get the pressure yes. washer out and hit it hard. Yes. Put a little degreaser foam on the rims and hit it with the pressure washer. I used to do the same thing too. Like, I haven't been to the, you know, I've been falling asleep with uh, Abba Zabba bars in my mouth for four <laughs> years. But at 8 a.m., I'm gonna hit it hard with a water pick before I go in and see the guy. He's got to give me a big thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I'm going to work out right before I see the trainer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, let's do one more, Gina. All right, well, let's give a little love to this guy with the best, most ironic, most chef's kiss name on the planet. There's a Florida man named Legenius Wisdom Williams. And he's struggling Hold on. Oh, sorry. Definitely not a Jew. <laughs> You'd be correct. Um, the 22-year-old Florida man's ironic name received a lot of attention in the news several years ago because he was convicted with attempted murder. He was released from prison in late 2020, 
Last week, he was arrested again, this time for domestic battery, felony gun and drug charges. They eventually captured and found him uh, with possessions of loaded firearms, cocaine and fentanyl. He was booked into Le Jail, thank you, and is being held on $77,000 bond. That's good. Le Genius Wisdom. <laughs> well, you had to know. This was going to be trouble from... Uh, can, I, can I say this? In most states, if you would like to do a vanity plate and, you know, your vanity plate is Dutch wide cock, they'd go like, sorry, we have certain standards in our community and you have crossed whatever that, whatever that line was. You cannot give your kid a retarded name. Can we agree? Like, can we have a, a vetting board where the genius... What was his uh, last name? Wisdom. Wisdom. Um, Legenius, Legenius Wisdom. Right, where you just, you can't do that because it's going to end up like this. And then also, there had to be somebody that right before he shot them went, Legenius, use your head. <laughs> Also, you know the guy was a shit student, right? So the four fucking oh, teachers yeah. had to be like, uh, Le Genius, that's a D minus. <laughs> had to be weird for the teacher. If he spaces off during a lesson, hello, Le Genius. Le Genius. Yes. All Wake right. up. Yeah, it never, hey it never oh, works. And, 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 and by the way, like, all the real smart guys had normal names like Albert. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Regular Elon. You know what I mean? They weren't like crazy names. <laughs> There's no guy named a uh, huge brain McGee. <laughs> who, <laughs> who cured cancer? But fucking huge brain McGee did. You know that guy. <laughs> It's just a regular name, and then they go out and they do something after that. You know what I mean? You can't put the name in, in front of the child. The child's got to earn the name. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah. Agreed. Uh, into the microphone. Sorry, Len. Yeah. <laughs> this is my first time on stage. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, Le Genius, and then he's going to be... Now do you, now who do we who do we make his cellmate in prison? Do we give him a, another? <laughs> whoever, whoever came up with the name, put his father in there. Oh yeah, put his dad. Well, his dad's probably already in there. I mean, <laughs> if I know the culture, <laughs> they put him, <laughs> put him uh, in there with them. But do you think he like do you like if you're working the roster out like like you know like if i'm running a prison and i'm working out you know like the seating chart you know what i mean like like you know i went to it's junior high way. and stuff well i'm saying like you gotta figure out who's selling with who you know you can't put a crip and a blood in the same cell you gotta work this shit out in advance right so, like, and when I was in junior high, they wouldn't put me and my buddy fucking Ray next to each other. Like, Ray, you're on that end. Carol, you're over there. Let's see how much real estate we get between you two assholes. So. <laughs> Where you, would they put Ray? Oh, in, in, in. Yeah. In class? In, in class. In the hall? In a cage. Yeah, they, they, put him, <laughs> <laughs> they put him on a uh, hand truck, like a Hannibal Lecter. They just <laughs> wheel him from class to class, park him in front of the yeah. blackboard. Yeah, they, uh, they, well, that's what happened. Ray, uh, Ray farted in Mr. Bernal's class so loud. You know, with the with the wooden remember the wooden contour seat that was attached to the desk oh, on a hot oh, oh, yeah. hot that June day, hard. like just lean over. There was no you can you can fart on cloth with four inches of padding and get some absorption. You know, you like some there's some acoustic aid to that. You get that hardwood contoured desk seat and Ray hikes a leg up people in other school districts heard that shit 
<laughs> he farted so he farted so loud and Mr. Bernal was pissed and everyone was super serious about it but I was laughing I was I was I was laughing so hard and he sent Ray out into the hall to go think about farting you know like <laughs> I like when you'd have to think about shit you, you planned, you know what I mean? Like Ray had been planning that fart since the eighth grade. Like, you go out that hall and you think about it. Like, okay. I'm gonna take a victory lap out in that hall, but what should I think about? Like, what, how much retroactive fart thought, Mr. Bernal, would you like me to engage in? Perhaps I should think about the future and other farts that haven't been let yet. But no, you want me to live in the past and think about the farts. What about the farts that haven't been born yet? What about the unborn farts? What about them? Don't they matter? So Ray was sent out in the hall to think about that fart. And then I was laughing so hard that he just moved me. <laughs> he didn't know where to go because he, he'd already shot his wad. He already took Ray out into the hall. He couldn't put me out in the hall. Then we'd both just be reminiscing about his fart. <laughs> so he got me out of my seat and he said, move it over there. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm moving nine feet to my left. I, away from the fart zone, by the way. I don't know why that's considered punishment. And think about what Ray did. <laughs> Think about Ray no, no, farting. don't think about what you Ray did about because that's laughing. what got you here. You think about you laughing about what came out of Ray's ass seven minutes ago, all right? You go over there, sit on that very unacoustic hardwood contoured seat attached to the desk, and you think about Ray farting over there. No, you think about Ray laughing. Ray, you better be thinking about what you farted. <laughs> I don't want you to be thinking about the Dodgers or your best girl. You think about farting. And when you're done, think about farts. I don't want to think I'll, about I'll this think thing. about bringing you back when you're, when you're proving that you're, when I can see in your eyes that you're completely done with fart thoughts. You know what? I'm going to assign you homework tonight, Ray. You go home and think about farting. This is the news. <laughs> All right, that's the news with Gina Grad, everybody. Gina Grad and the news with Gina Grad. Paul Bryan and the course uh, Dickie Barrett, everybody. God bless you, Dickie. Love you, Adam. Love you. I love your show. Love you. Go backstage. Order yourself uh, a little I something shall. off the menu. All right. Uh, we will do the uh, unprepared now. Is Brent out there? Brent, the uh, ball, the ball hopper. Brent. Oh, we bringing our ball out here? Yeah. All this right. We'll work Brent. that out. Thanks, Dickie. Oh, Bye good. Guys. Brent. Brent is a uh, ex scuba instructor, and uh, he's uh, loves himself some F1. And we'll put the uh, we'll put it up top there. Brent, Brent's sober, drinking a Pellegrino. What's going on, Brent? Uh, well, I'm what they call California sober. So. California yeah, sober. Yeah, so you smoke pleasure, a lot pleasure. of Hi. smoke a lot of weed. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. There we yeah. go. You high now? I definitely am high. All yeah. right. <laughs> There we go. Did you eat an edible? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. When when did you eat the edible? Um, about 20 minutes before I walked in here. All right. So it's full effect right yeah, now. Absolutely. We're All right. Out. It's All right. Awesome. Well, let's go. Let's see. Let's see uh, if it affects your cool. performance. Let's go. All right. So we spin it, and there comes the ball. And the first ball says, um, "I have no idea. Is it Camellia?" Camellia. I don't know what that is. All right. Maybe it's Camilla. 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 Carmella. Camilla. Camilla. All right. I will, uh, I will take that. Okay. Um, <laughs> we, Camilla. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, oh, our vice president. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Camilla. There it is. Camilla. All right. Uh, look. Um, <clears throat> so, what the fuck is wrong with this person? Could someone get this crazy bitch a thesaurus? Like, she just 
talks in circles about what we need to do is we need to do now and if we don't do now then never is a good time better than now i mean i'd rather have mr bernal tell ray to go out to the fucking hall and think about farting <laughs> just come up the thing that's crazy about kamala harris is she sat there and was interviewed by lester holt she was made the border czar so she was put in charge by the United States of our southern border. And then she went and did a softball interview with Lester Holt. And Lester Holt said to her, have you been to the border? Which is, if you were preparing for, first off, if you're preparing, it'd be, it'd be, that would be the very first thing you prepared for. Like when he asked that question, have a cogent answer prepared. It'd be like if a cop pulled you over and went, have you been drinking tonight? And you went, well, I stopped while I was fucking your mother, but then I started again. Like when you see the fucking rollers, put an answer together. You know what I mean? Just one light beer, or uh, I ate a huge meal and had just a, a one shot of Jaeger. Like, fucking put something together. So she's sitting there, and he goes, have you been to the border? And she's like, whoa, whoa, what? What? I, where's this coming from? And he's like... <laughs> You're the border czar. At some point, you go to the fucking border. If you were the fucking... If I made you the czar of Home Depot, be prepared for me to ask you, have you been to a Home Depot? It's not going to be an outlandish question. If I made you the fucking czar of a pottery barn, be prepared for a hard-hitting question. Like, have you ever been to a pottery barn? So he says, have you ever been to the border... And then she does this one. She goes, we've been to the border. And he's like, we? <laughs> and she, she's like, yeah, we've been to the border. And then he goes, have you been to the border? And she's like, well, no, I haven't been to the border. And then she goes, but here's the best part about that exchange. She's all, she's put off and she's confused. She's like, what, what do you mean? I, where's this coming from? Yeah, I've, I've been to Europe. I haven't been to Europe. I've been everywhere. I've been to me. I've laid down with princes and whatever the fuck that gay song is from the 80s. She, she's literally confused. And so here's the deal on a, uh, on a more serious note uh, that everyone gets offended by. <clears throat> we do this thing where we go, Joe Biden is like, um, well, if I'm elected, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have the first fill in the blank. I'm going to have the first woman of color who will be vice president. And my feeling is, is I'm all for progress. But if that bitch can't put a fucking thought together, maybe we should get a white chick in there. <laughs> Or a red-headed dude who can fucking form a thought or an idea or solve a problem. I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Like, I, I'm conceptually, I'm with you. But I don't want to be on a fucking airplane where they go, we're going to have the first lesbian, half-Indian woman of color try to land this airplane. I don't want to be on that fucking flight. I'd rather have some fucking racist dude with a receding hairline <laughs> safely land this plane, and then we could talk about progress. <laughs> and then, by the way, does it move, does it move, what does it do for the movement, right? I mean, let's, let's do the math. Okay, everyone hates me, this is offensive. I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> Let, let's just do this. They go, we're going to have a woman of color do this super important job. And you go, all right, why? And they go, because I want to send a message to America that a uh, woman of color uh, can do this job. And you go, okay. And then she fucks the job up 10 ways to Sunday. So if you want to do, if you want to reverse engineer this thought, well, I guess black chicks can't be the vice president. That's what I got. 
I have the opposite of what you're trying to do. I'm now worried. <laughs> she is, her approval ratings are lower than his approval ratings, <laughs> which is basically, and his are super low. So this is basically, maybe he likes it that way. Maybe he's like, maybe he's like a high school student who's walking around his house with a D minus grade point average. And his dad is like, God damn son, your grade point average is so horrible. And he's like, yeah, well, your other son, Kurt, he's in juvie. <laughs> So, live with it, bitch. <laughs> so Biden's walking around at like 39%, but Kamala's 33, so he can sleep at night. She seems weird and maniacal and sort of detached and has these uh, crazy spasms of laughter. And also, I don't know if you guys are with me on this, but the fucking bullshit retroactive stories, you know what I mean? Where like Joe Biden tells a lot of these bullshit stories. I, there's nothing more pathetic and sort of cloying than the weird, I was part of the movement like back in the day, like, you know, Joe Biden does this thing where it's like, when I was, when I was seven, I was walking with my dad through Scranton and we saw two dudes kissing. And I said, Dad, what's going on with those fellas? And he said, son, they're gay, and they should be celebrated. And I got a rainbow flag, and I went up to them, and I hugged them. In 1952, in Scranton, I don't think so, Joe. I don't think that fucking happened. If your dad in 1952 saw two dudes sucking face in Scranton, he'd be like, go get me my tube sock full of nickels. <laughs> Repeat the shit out of these homos, boy. That's a bullshit story that never happened. Kamala Harris tells the story when she was like two, she was on a freedom march and her mom said to her, what do you want? And she looked at her mom and she said, I want freedom. <laughs> Bullshit, bitch. You fucking never happened. You're so goddamn lucky ring doorbells weren't invented. <laughs> Joe Biden is so lucky ring doorbells didn't exist in Scranton in 1952. Sorry. Oh, that, that Got another ball. I do, I do. Yeah. Something we can I want to say this too. Sorry. <laughs> I don't like all that folksy talk. You know what I mean? Like all these politicians, they're fucking rich. You got your son going to China and Russia and Mexico and Ukraine and fucking putting on the boards of energy companies and cashing checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars flying on Air Force Two. And it's a lot of like, oh, shucks, we're just working class folks, you know? The bullshit story, you know the, what I'm tired of hearing politicians talk about? Kitchen table conversations. I got a kitchen table, I got kids, I would never talk to them about jack shit. <laughs> He does this thing, you know, he's talking about gas prices. You're like, you know, I remember when I was, when I was a boy growing up in Scranton and uh, they raised the cost of gas. That'd be a kitchen room. That'd be a kitchen table conversation. Me and my dad have sitting around talking. Okay, so uh, Joe Biden, uh, when you were a kid in Scranton and it was 1952, the cost of gas was 29 cents a gallon. So when it went up, to 30 cents a gallon, you and your dad sat down, <laughs> had a long talk about gas going from 29 to 31 fucking cents a gallon. I don't think so. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, next ball. No. Kitchen table conversations. So something we cannot get upset about is key parties. Key parties? Key parties. Key parties, is that like a swingers thing? I don't know, you tell me. Do we put all our keys in a, in a basket and then whoever's key you pull out, you go and fuck? Yes, I think that's a general idea here. See, none of the guys 
want to let on that they know exactly what a key party is because they're sitting next to their wife who has no idea what a key party is because he said he was going to go out bowling, not go out fucking strange pussy. But one guy did give me a little raise of a brow and a knowing nod. So this dude knows what a key party is. I've not participated in a, in a key party. I've had my car keyed by a chick I tried to fuck once, but that was a, that's a story for a different day. Now, the thing about the key party is you can't have it be, you know, all fives as far as the chicks go. You got to have one ten and one one in there to really make that decision when the guy's going after the keys and then also you got to look for stuff on the keychain like I see the Ralph's Club card that's a heifer <laughs> no, I don't pick that chain up <laughs> I don't know if you get the whole chain in there and we get to read it a little bit uh, yeah absolutely. you know what I mean I don't know what else you you put on your your keychain. There's also uh, weapons. There's little weapons. There's a thing called a kubaton, which you could put on that keychain. Remember those things? All the uh, all it was like you'd hold it in your fist, and you'd I don't know. Has anyone ever done that where they grabbed their keys and made like a weird weapon out of out of something? I feel like you just get raped harder if you do that. <laughs> like uh, the, like the guy's like oh. You know, I was gonna give you a light raping and then you got the keychain out and you fucking put a divot in my cheek and now, now we're going dry. Should have thought about that. By the way, that mace is giving me a boner. So you get the keys out and then you end up in, uh, in the room and how does it work? Like, what if you get the key and you end up going to the room with someone you're not attracted to? Do you just fucking, fucking bite on a wooden spoon <laughs> while you're eating pussy? <laughs> do you just fucking do it? Or do you like, do you, do you, do you like pull a groin? You know what I mean? Lights, like, lights out for sure. Lights out for sure. Because I'll do a move where I'm walking to the bed and roll an ankle and then just go down hard, you know, and just start talking about high school ball. And <laughs> Why don't we just order some room service and watch Netflix? <laughs> Let me elevate my ankle. I don't know. I don't. You feel like swinging, and uh, don't. I, I feel like it's too much. Like I, I, I feel like it's a, it's a pretty big commitment. I feel like I would start laughing at some point. I'd say something stupid. It just. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what they like. You know, they don't. They don't know what I like. But I'm gonna fucking tell them. That's for sure. <laughs> And women, why don't you just fucking tell us what you want? We're too tired of guessing sexually what you want. And stop pretending like you don't know what you want. You know what you fucking want. Just put it out there. Put it up front. I don't want your market price on the menu. Give me the specials when I'm walking into the bedroom. I want it written with a dry erase board walking in there. I don't want to have to kick tires or pussy. I want... You to just fucking tell me what you want. I'll explain why I can't do it. You, you can start blowing me, and we can move forward from there. Okay? Thank you. Let's do one more. One more? Okay. All right. Nope. A little too fast. We're going to grab it. Uh, Dolly. Dolly, can I say this, Brent? Yes. You're one of those guys who I feel like I know exactly what you looked like when you were a kid. Wow. Okay. Do you know there's certain people where you go, oh, yeah, I know what he looked like when he was nine? Hopefully it wasn't a douchebag. Uh, no, oh, it, was, okay. it was a version of this. But I know I, I got this feeling like I, you know, remember uh, 
former attorney general Bill Barr. Oh, great. You feel like you know what that guy looked like when he was nine? Like, if you opened a yearbook and Bill Barr was in a, you know, fourth grade class, you could fucking pick that guy out. I could pull you out of a yearbook. I do have a photo where I look very similar to this, actually, wearing a suit and tie. And how old were you? About nine. I knew you! I, yeah. I knew you looked like you! Yeah. I should work for the fucking Scotland Yard! Yeah. I could tell almost everyone looked like them. If there was a perp on the loose, I'd go, we gotta look, we gotta look for this guy who used to look younger, but now he looks like this. So fan out! I just always wanted to say that in front of a group of dudes. All right, fan out. One gay guy starts fanning himself, you know. Christ. Larry, no. All right, sorry, what was it, Dolly? It was Dolly, yes. Well, there's Dolly Parton, which, right. which everyone loves, or whom everyone loves. Mm -hmm. And then there's Dolly, which I used to call... I, a dolly was a thing you used to move cases of shit around when I was a kid. And then at some point, some asshole had to introduce the term hand truck. And I don't know where that came from, but then we switched from dolly to hand truck. Is this a regional thing? Were people on the East Coast, like, <clears throat> you know, people on the East Coast would be, say, like, sneakers, and we'd say tennis shoes. And they'd say, you know, filling station, and we'd say gas station. And would they say hand truck, and we'd say dolly? And where do you land in Denver? Because we're not really East or West Coast here. Dolly, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking dolly, right? Well, who are all these highfalutin folks out there with their la -dee da hand trucks? I don't know what that is. Those people what are if, from Boston, probably. Yeah, you, you know what I'd like to do? I don't, yeah, I don't like any of those, <laughs> those highfalutin hand truck people out there. You know, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to uh, get that uh, video of Conor McGregor grabbing that device and throwing it through the window of that bus, and then I would ask fellas, <clears throat> What, uh, what did Conor McGregor throw at that bus? <laughs> and every single one of them that said, hand truck, I would beat the shit out of. <laughs> Chris, write that shit down. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Let's get that going, man. And by the way, I always tell you this shit, and then you forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> write this shit down. I want to fucking make sure we get it going this time. So I am uh, I am of the uh, school who calls uh, that a dolly hand truck. And by the way, it's it's it takes too long, you know. And the time, so what? Let me do this experiment. Look what a huge waste of time hand truck is, right? In terms of wasted time in a conversation. Hey Bob, why don't you go to the warehouse and make sure and use your hand truck. Or, why don't you go to the warehouse and bring your dolly? See that? <laughs> fucking done. So much fucking faster that was. He probably would have moved all the shit by the time I got done, say, if I said dolly versus hand truck, you know? Very correct. <clears throat> then there's Dolly Parton. And Dolly Parton is beloved or beloved. I'm not sure which one we've settled on, but she is a beloved creature. We used to kind of make fun of her. Now we love her, but no one ever really scratches her lottery ticket. Like, oh, she was super poor and she grew up in the uh, hills of Kentucky and, and everyone respects her. Everyone respects her, all the community and the songwriting community and everyone loves Dolly Parton. And no one ever goes, she has huge fake titties and weird wigs. Does that fucking strike anybody as strange, you know? Yeah, but she can write really good songs. Right. With her hand just below her weird fake titties and her fucking huge mop of uh, bleach blonde wig hair. And then I ask you, all right, everyone loves Dolly, and she's the greatest, and she's, a, you know, she's an American treasure, but what if you had an aunt with huge fake titties who wore super tight belts all the time and had massive fake wig hair, and she would come over for Thanksgiving, and she was a good songwriter? 
wouldn't you still go, yeah, she can write a song, but <laughs> she's still fucking weird because she has huge fake titties and a huge fucking blonde wig, which is getting into the stuffing on Thanksgiving. How come we just bypass the part where she has huge 44 triple C clown titties and a massive weird wig? Are we not allowed to delve into this? We can't bring it up? What if, like, like all right, let, let's, let's be fair. Okay, let's, let's take, <clears throat> let's take a belo- uh, beloved songsmith, uh, Burt Bacharach. That guy has written many, many a great song. Look up Burt Bacharach. I mean, he may have written uh, Do You Know the Way to San Jose and many, many other timeless, timeless songs. Burt Bacharach, okay. Let's just say Chris will tell us. All right, so he co-wrote uh, This Guy's In Love With You. Rain this Dra- Guy's In Love With You, which was the number one hit uh, by uh, 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 Herb Alpert. Yeah. Raindrops Keep Falling Rain On My Head. Raindrops Keep Falling On My Head. All right. Uh-huh. They Long To Be Close To You. Close To You. The Carpenter's Close To You? Yeah. Arthur's right. theme, best thing. The you theme can do. from Arthur. <laughs> Everyone loves the Arthur movie. And uh, that's what friends are for. That's what friends are. <laughs> okay, I didn't know I had this much range, you know, vocally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Burt Bacharach, he's a guy who writes a lot of hit songs, beloved hit songs, just like Dolly, with her big, huge, fake titties that we can't talk about. All right, so just a, just a thought experiment. What if Burt Bacharach? had a huge fake cock. It was just bulged out of his pants. Like, man, it's like packing like a, like, um, like, you know, anyone who's ever planted zucchinis and then left them alone, <laughs> they just keep growing into huge retarded zucchinis with learning disabilities. What if he took one of those huge untended giant zucchinis you forgot about in your garden and he shoved it in his pants and he's walked around with a huge fake cock and then he put on a crazy Albert Einstein wig and we were talking about Burt Baccarat that's all we would say it was a wonderful songsmith wonderful wonderful he gives so much he gives so much back he's collaborating with Dave Grohl you know that and that's all I have to say that's it. I have no more to say about the man. No! We would. We talk about his huge fake cock and his big mop of hair. All right. Thank you, guys. It's not going to get any better than that. I... <laughs> thank Quinn for coming out here and doing a yeoman's job tonight. And until next time, this is Adam Carolla for Dickie Bear and Gina Grad and Bill Bryan and Brent saying mahalo. I'd like to start the show with some local thoughts. I know the uh, Avalanche is uh, playing tonight. <laughs> Fuck you guys, you're not fans. <laughs> You'd be at the arena or in front of your TV set yelling at your kid to get the fuck out of the room if you're real fans. Let's not confuse you with real fans.